somebody mentioned this, so I'm going to bring it up because I was like, oh, I used, it used to happen to me. So there was a time I had, I was teaching yoga, so I had a lot of classes in the morning and then I taught classes in the evening. And in the afternoon, I always took an afternoon nap almost every day. So I napped for like 45 minutes to an hour. And every time I took a nap, I had an orgasm. Very, you know, just I would wake up and all of a sudden I would be orgasmic. Um, And I would notice also that I would be very, uh, the breath would be very, very different. And I was slightly frozen, but that I was, it was a state that I was getting used to because it was every day I would get into that state and I would feel the tingling. Is this common? Why is it that it only happened in the afternoon, not at night, that I never noticed? It was always if I took an afternoon nap. And why would the orgasm happen every time in that afternoon? Okay. So it's important to understand that the orgasm in the body is a healing mechanism. When you, when anyone has an orgasm, it, we are designed in such a way that orgasm creates an electromagnetic pulse that is supposed to move up through the body. Now, for a lot of people, it doesn't move up. It, you know, it's mostly concentrated in the abdomen and around the genitals, etc. To compensate for the fact that it doesn't move up, what happens in um, right at pre-orgasmic, a few minutes before that orgasm is going to occur, is the body sends all of its blood to the abdomen and to the genitals. And so when that orgasm occurs, even if it doesn't go anywhere up the body, all of that blood is charged and then moves through the body lickety split 150 160 miles per hour or per second even um, and carries that electromagnetic charge which then pulls all of your cells back into alignment your cells have a north pole and a south pole so that electromagnetic blood pulls things back into alignment and if the pulse does move up then, then it heals even more. It can move up to the heart. Your heart will go like trip hammer. <laughs> um, it can move to your throat, um, at which point you might you say you might make a noise or cry out or something. Um, you know, if it moves up to the third eye, you'll see this explosion of light. And if it moves all the way up, then you'll have a momentary kundalini experience. You'll touch the source. And that's what you're made of. And that's what the goal of the orgasm is, is to put you back in touch with your source, which knows your perfection. And so when you have all kinds of stuff happening that gets you all discombobulated every day, the orgasm then corrects that. And so until you learn how to not get all discombobulated, um, you'll need to make love a lot. And you'll need to have an orgasm every chance you get. Now, if you, let's say you uh, didn't take a nap and you go to bed that night, by that time, you're almost too tired for the orgasm to occur. So in the middle of the afternoon, you're not too tired. The body has to marshal a huge amount of energy to produce that healing uh, frequency. It's like a, it's like a donut that moves up through the body and hits every single chakra and pulls everything back into alignment. So um, a lot of people, uh, you know, you hear jokes, um, you know, women will say, oh, I have a headache or I'm too tired. They are, they are. The best time to make love is in the afternoon. If you don't have a lover and you, you know, and you have a nap and they have an orgasm, you're all set. You're renewed for the rest of the day. Um, and that, and then you have a sleep period that's your nighttime. And then the next day you get up and you teach again. And so that's becomes the cycle. It's a healing cycle. Sex is for healing. So is there a correlation somehow when you describe the end state and the orgasm, Uh they lead to the same place or is it two different things or is it, is there Uh correlation somewhere? Um, Nah, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. (laughs) So um, an orgasm can lead to the capacity to enter into the end state at will. Um, But an orgasm, the goal of the orgasm is to put you back in touch with the source, with the Godhead. 
with what you're made of, because that's where all of the bliss and all the healing is, okay? And you only have to touch that for a second or two. Um, and wow, I mean, you talk about power. I mean, everybody knows that an orgasm is extremely powerful um, and you're relaxed afterward. Why? Because all of your cells are back in alignment um, and they're communicating. So, uh, hang on, let me say one other thing. Um, when you're in the end state, you are source functioning. You, uh, so when you go into the source, you don't have, you're not aware of yourself. All you're aware of is this amazing bliss and, and it's paralyzing bliss. It's like bliss that you could you could get lost in there you could stay in there forever and never come out <laughs> okay um so, uh, when you get into the end state you're in that bliss but you're fully aware of yourself you're fully aware of your um power of your consciousness of your work of you know you're fully aware you are individuated source um, we don't have much of that at this at the human level in our 3D world. Um, not very many people are even present to the 3D world, let alone present to themselves as a creature of source. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does that yeah, make because, sense to you? Yeah, because we talked about this before, but when I said that I, I used oh. to do yoga and I was into yoga, that's what yoga meant. Yoga men was a union again that you understand that you were part of God's source, but you be, you remain individuated. Now we've like right. trans, we've translated it as just doing exercise, but the original meaning of where, where we were practicing yoga to reach yoga, it is a state of being of right. exactly what you're describing. But you know it's lost a lot okay. of its meaning. But I'd like to ask you something else yeah. about about the orgasm. So I know that in my okay. generation, I mean my I'm close to my fifties now, that there's a lot of women yeah. who have uh, the orgasm has been um, or sex has been pretty much vilified a little bit as dirty. There's, there's a lot of stuff around sex, as you know. Um, I know. And a lot of that's, women. That's yes, yes. And a lot of women I know, I remember when, you know, I was in my 20s and we talked with, with girl talk. And the majority of women <laughs> I knew never had an orgasm with a man. Right? Yeah. So it, was very, yeah. it was something that seemed to be very stuck in a lot of people. And right. so. And I remember that, you know, I, I would nap and have an orgasm. And for me, it was like, well, I don't need really to have sex. I just have to take a nap and I have an orgasm. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so, so what I'm asking you is like what we talked right now about the experience that you had of the end state and to feel that, that touching of that end state where you feel that you're healing through the breath work can seem very challenging for many. Um, in terms of, um, I don't... I don't know if we can get past the um, the religious fallout that has occurred as a result of, you know, the, the whole sexual thing has been so misunderstood, so contaminated by religion and culture and and so ruined by um, the ideas that that we have inherited from past times and in the whole sexual thing um that just i mean I, we could get into a whole rat's nest of of how did, how did we get this way um that whole thing of sex is really it's a personal healing journey um when two lovers come together what they want to do in order to ensure long life and joy and whatever is to increase the well-being of each other. And so they make love and they come to orgasm and each one comes out of that healed. Um, if you're carrying a load of guilt and shame and all kinds of ideas or you've been abused when you were younger, there's problems. It's hard to enjoy the whole thing. Um, there's so many associations with it. And when, when we, especially in the West, um, the natural time to start sexual experience is when you reach puberty. 
So what do we do for the first six or seven years of puberty? Oh, no, don't, don't touch yourself. Don't have an orgasm. Dude. You can't do that till you get married. You get married and then it's like, what? <laughs> what is this about? Um, that whole thing has been ruined because the natural time for it has passed. Number one, the natural start for it. You never really get past the need for that um, because you because you have a body. Um, and the sex in other cultures is very different. It's very different. Uh, I should say sex in other places, other planets, other civilizations is very different. Um, but there's still sex because it's a healing mechanism. And, and so you have to work on the whole religious thing, the whole educational thing. Um, now they're teaching all kinds of crap that is it's ugly it's not beautiful that's stupid is what it is um and so people struggle i'm not sure how to get people past that um i mean there are i probably have some ideas about that but um i don't know that we could talk about it here <laughs> um but still in all it's something that if we can't get past then healing it stays at arm's length. It doesn't, it isn't something that occurs in the individual with a sense of joy. Now, let me just make a little closing statement. When you get into the end state, I'll call it that level of consciousness, you're in this bliss and you have this power to heal. And so the, the, you, there isn't orgasmic, there isn't orgasm because you're already in what I'm going to call the state of bliss and you're fully conscious and you're making things work the way they should. Um, so it's not quite the same as orgasm. You just, it's, it isn't quite the same orgasm for most humans is, uh, you know, um, I don't want to say wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Um, you know, it's a quick thing. I mean, there can be some cultures um, where lovemaking is an art form. And there are others where it's just, um, you know, very quick, uh, not, not much lovemaking to it, um, et cetera, not much foreplay. But um, you don't need any foreplay to have an orgasm. When the body needs to have one, you can be doing anything and it will... Uh, sometimes generate what's called a subconscious level orgasm in which you'll feel that release happening on a very small scale. You might be sitting at your desk working on some budget for some corporation. Um, so, yeah, that's it's the body's going to do what it needs to do and it's going to release when and restore and renew when it can. But the Kundalini so. experience is still very orgasmic. Oh, that's an understatement. Okay, so, so it's not just, it's, it's still something from my understanding right now, what I, I see the orgasm at is that it's that electrical current that moves up the spine and is able to, that's awaken, right. okay. And so in order okay. to get to that end state or to touch the Godhead or to, to, to reach source, you yeah. need to have more and more currents that move up and you become right. more charged. Okay. Yeah. So it is, yeah. and it's supposed to be part of a nat natural cycle of the human being to move towards that, towards that end state, correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we are question. designed for that to move all the way through and make us evolved beings. But well, you get religion in there and it's aborted right there. So when you're talking about that the end state doesn't have the word, the orgasm per se, it's because you've already reached a state of, um, of you're bliss. in a state of bliss all okay. the time. Okay. So the yeah. orgasm is just kind of like a huge and, and, and not that you can't handle it, but it's difficult to handle because it's such a strong surge or it's because our body right. is not meant to hold it. Let's put it this way. It's an out of control surge. And that's where, you know, it can do some damage or it can uh, cause some problems or it can melt you down and you, <laughs> you know, you burn up, you turn, you, it's called idiopathic. Uh, combustion, idiopathic human combustion, idiopathic meaning we don't know where it comes from. 
and the human burns up the human burns up from the inside out yes. or, or something melts off you know your toes melt off or your arm melts off and um etc but i think many people will relate to this so i've had sometimes many dreams in the past where i'm for example uh -huh. floating or flying or you know doing yeah. different things and i'm conscious in the dream and in the dream i often think Ah, it's as if, uh, you know, living in a perpetual orgasm, because as I'm floating, I'm like in a bliss state. So I'm either floating in the yeah. sky or just above my bed. And I'm like, ah, oh, this right. is, you know, so is that the same thing? As the, <laughs> okay, so, but for me, is that the same thing? Is that, is that what you say that you're, it's more of a, a state, whereas the orgasm is something else? So I'm just trying to differentiate between the two, because when I'm floating, and I have that blissful feeling of, and I think, oh, man, this is like a perpetual orgasm. You know, it's like so not overwhelming, but it's like so blissful. Um, is it a different? Um, it's yeah, there's a difference between a charge and a state. OK, so steady state um, of bliss is just that um, a charge moving through <clears throat> is going to have a certain amount of punch, a certain amount of power. Um, and so that it is different. Uh, if you're floating or you're flying in a dream or you're fully awake, lucid in a dream and you're deliberately moving about making things happen, um, that's not necessarily um, orgasmic or it may feel like you're very powerful, but that's because you are feeling a different level of energy. And you're in touch with much more energy than you normally are in touch with in, when you're in your 3D body. Um, it's a, amazing to me how dense um, these bodies are. They are just, they're kind of cloddy sometimes. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. that. There's, a, there's many ways of healing. That's what I'm trying to get at is that, okay, if, you, if you're able to have an orgasm with your partner or on your own when you're sleeping right. or... Um, if you're able to right. have these kinds of lucid dreamings where you kind of wake up, you know, you're still dreaming, but you're feeling these yeah. are all moments of healing that we could learn, actually, even if it's just for a few seconds uh -huh. there that you're kind of awake in the dream that you could focus on healing. Could you do that even if it's just for a short amount of time? Yeah. If you become lucid in a dream, then you have access to, uh, uh, let me say it this way, if you can hang on to that state of clarity which was what being lucid is i know that my body is over there sleeping and i'm over here <laughs> and you know how to use the language of energy then you can make something happen in the energetic world that will transfer to your physical world because they are one and the same and so the language of energy you do something I think I gave the example in, in one of my books about uh, being in this storm and realizing if I could just brush those clouds away, that it would clear the clouds from my physical life around my finances. And, and I had come so close to losing this place again and again and again and pulled out. And after that dream of brushing away the clouds, intentionally saying, um, knowing, feeling, it wasn't even a, it was just this spontaneous thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting rid of the financial clouds. Um, and, and I brushed those clouds away and the sun came out and that was the end of my financial struggles. Um, it would, and that was just such a, like, well, that was so easy. <laughs> um, and so it's a moment of being able to use that kind of energy in an altered state in which you have access to more power. Um, we don't use our power here, we just don't. You mentioned just as a side note before that when there's an orgasm, you mentioned the word donut as an illustration that it moves from one, yeah. from one chakra to the next. So I've always wanted to ask yeah. you this, have you been able to see like for yourself, when you were having many Kundalini experiences around somebody else, what it looks like when there's that charge of frequency 
running up the spine? Because you described it like that. Is it because you've seen it? How? Uh, not so much seeing. When um, Kundalini occurs, okay? So, um, so one of the things that you become aware of after the first Kundalini is everything. <laughs> and so you become aware that you are in the center of a vortex of, of a torus that is circling, cycling. And there's, it's mostly incoherent energy, but it's still cycling in this big torus. Um, up the center, out and down, and then up the center, out and down. Um, and so when what happens is that um, you begin in a kundalini experience, even a low grade one, um, you begin to feel the energy gathering around your legs. And that energy, you can, it, it be, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's your legs are alive. Okay. And your legs are turned on. And your legs become aware. And then if, if, that, if it progresses to full kundalini orgasmic um, responses, what you get is that as this thing cycles, it comes around and it's absolutely all the charge is in a, like a circle around you. And it charges you as it moves up. And you feel that. Um, moving up in you, through you, around you, um, and you hear it, you hear the roaring sound, um, you may see the flash at the, at the top, um, but the, you experience that as this donut of energy that is pulsing as the torus moves up um, and is hitting you from all sides. <laughs> so, um, and it may be, I remember reading um, that the, uh, it was energy moving up the spine. I did not experience energy moving up the spine at all. I experienced energy moving up the center front of me and thought, well, maybe I have another spine there. <laughs> but um, what actually was happening was that um, the energy of the, each nerve plexus in the spine was responding to that pulse and the plexus would, would pulse and it would pull in all at once. And then it would move to the next chakra or pulse or nerve plexus and it would pulse with the next pulse. And, um, and it's uh, very, very powerful. When you talk about nerve plexus, it's the physical nerve plexus you're talking about that you can see. Physical, yeah. Okay. You feel it, you hear it. You know, I wasn't looking, but I was aware of this freight train. You're, it's like you're in the center of this vortex of energy and it's pulsing as it moves up and it's taking you right with it. So very, very powerful. Possible if you could recap a little bit as we started this with the end state and healing with your experience that you had recently of your injury and how you were able to to heal a lot of that. And then I wanted us to talk about it because I think it's important for people to start thinking um, of different ways, little things that they could use daily just to begin to heal themselves. Because yeah. I would say this, um, we're moving into a time um, and a challenge that we have for a long time called the shift. So what's actually shifting? We are shifting ourselves to another state of consciousness where another set of capacities are at our fingertips. And, and that's the leap that we need to be making. Um, if we, let's say we get into, uh, let's say the world falls down or the, the something collapses, the government collapses, uh, maybe the financial system and the medical, the whole thing just falls apart. Um, and everybody's struggling over everything. What you want to be able to do is to heal yourself um, if you need to. That's basic. And so one of the things you want to be able to do when you don't have any other tools except your consciousness is to understand how to use that consciousness. And that breath affects and in fact even controls consciousness 
you know, if somebody comes along and squeezes the breath out of you, you're done here. You don't have any consciousness here anymore. If you come along and say, I'm going to learn to use that breath to enhance or to get in charge of my consciousness and, in, and to enter into other states, then you can heal anything and you can heal someone else. So that is very, very important to know and understand that that's possible, that that's a potential for you. Um, and when you get desperate, um, that's when you have enough focus to be able to say, I'm not getting up until this is fixed. I'm not going to stop this until this is over. If you're healing someone else, you'll have a message or you'll have a knowing or you'll have a vision that they're better. Something will happen. It's different every time. Um, but the message will be, yep, thank you. You know, you may suddenly see their smiling face <laughs> or whatever. Um, we do not need, I mean, it's nice and it's convenient and it's quick to have all the medical system that we have. But when push comes to shove and we don't have that, my gosh, we better have ourselves. We better have our breath. We better have some idea of what is possible because anybody can enter into an altered state using breath. So um, don't, don't shy away. Try stuff. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Try stuff. Um, it's so important. Um, you're going to surprise yourself with what you can do. You know, we talk about the end state that you experience the end state of the current human. Um, and I had mm -hmm. once asked you, so will we see this end state in this lifetime? And you said, no, it may take a few thousand years before we end. We see that end state. Well, as a civilization, <laughs> I, some of us will. Some of us will see that end state. Well, there are people here that are in that, that fully potentiated state. 